Well, good morning, everybody. Appreciate everyone being here this morning. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Acts 26. We'll be there just momentarily. Acts 26. This is the last class of the quarter. Kind of flew by. Appreciate everyone being here and being in this class, participating. It's been a fantastic class, personally, for me. Usually that's what happens. The teacher usually gets more out of it than the student does. Uh, there's our objectives that we have followed throughout the whole quarter, and certainly we will hit some of those today. Uh, last class is on persuasive preaching. Uh, let's think about this question before we dive into the text in verse 15 real quick. How does anybody get persuaded by anything at all? Yeah, it's a lot of weird words there, but I thought I didn't know any better way to describe that. How does anybody get persuaded by anything at all? Dale, yes, he, 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 uh, the goading of a wife is what he's describing there. So, yeah, that, that, is, that is one way to do it. But, uh, but we'll, we'll come back to this uh, question here shortly. Uh, let's read, uh, starting in verse 15 of Acts 26, we'll read through the chapter. And I, Paul said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to point you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking true and rational words, for the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I'm persuaded that none of these things have escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all those who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So here's a Paul, he's on trial in front of great elites of the time, in front of Herod Agrippa. And he was a, a client king, a king over Judea. And Festus, this new imperial governor, is receiving a visit from Agrippa. And Paul was in prison, and he was charged for a number of things, for sedition, causing a riot, undermining public peace, heresy. And so Festus, this Gentile who's new to governing the area, he didn't really understand Jewish theology. He didn't really understand Jewish politics. And so he asked King Agrippa, whose families lived in Judea their whole lives, generations, to come and listen to Paul so that he can develop a case to provide Rome because Paul has appealed to Caesar, because he realized that he could not get a fair trial. 
in Judea because of the Jewish pressure. So Paul's in prison, and he'd been charged, and Festus has to write up this case to deliver to Rome. And he's out of his league in writing this case. He can't write this case because he doesn't understand what the Jews believe, what their traditions are, and so Agrippa is there. And his entourage is there. Who's in the audience when Paul preaches this sermon? We have Festus, we have Agrippa, and a couple other people that are mentioned in the text. Bernice, so that would have been Agrippa's sister. Who else? It says something about city officials, prominent men of the city. So there are some really important people within this audience, the cultural elites of the time. Uh, we'll get to that question just shortly. And so the occasion, like we just described, Paul or Festus needs to write a case. Um, and this case is really difficult for Festus to write. Uh, look at the text real quick. We'll see verse um, 18 of chapter 25. 18... Verse 18 of chapter 25, when the accuser stood up, this is Festus talking, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I suppose. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with them about their own religion and about certain, a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked him whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. Look in uh, verse 25 says, but I found that he had not, done nothing deserving death, and he himself appeal, appealed to the emperor. Uh, verse 26, but I have nothing definite to write to my Lord about him. So you see, he's kind of in a conundrum. He needs to be able to provide some reasonable case to Rome in front uh, of Herod Agrippa. I, I really like this uh, quote about kind of the, the temperature in the room. It was a dramatic moment when the holy and humble apostle of Jesus Christ stood before the representative of the worldly, ambitious, morally corrupt family of the Herods, who for generation after generation had set themselves in opposition to truth and righteousness. Their founder, Herod the Great, had tried to destroy the infant Jesus, his son Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee, beheaded John the Baptist, and won from the Lord the title of Fox. His grandson Agrippa I slew James the son of Zebedee with the sword. Now we see Paul brought before Agrippa's son. So this is, this is kind of the temperature in the room. These people have not been very kind to God's people. And so Paul gives an offense, defense. For two years, Paul has been imprisoned. Felix imprisoned him and just kind of left it there. Just kind of left it in a stalemate for Festus to deal with later on. So Paul's been in prison for two years, waiting for this moment of vindication. And he tells his story of conversion on the road to Damascus. But it's at the end of Paul's speech that Paul really shows us the goal of his speech. What he's really after. And it's surprising because he's really not out to defend himself. If he was out to defend himself, uh, he does a fairly poor job of doing it. Um, it's described by Luke as a defense of himself. Uh, Paul calls uh, saying that he makes it his defense in chapter 26 and verse 2. But what is he defending? He's defending his faith. He's defending the gospel which he preached and which he lived. The gospel is on trial. And he sees this opportunity to preach Jesus to them. Because if his prim primary goal was to get out of it himself, was to get off the hook and truly defend himself, he would have never made the bold move that he makes in this, in this text. He would have played it safe, but he doesn't. So what was Paul's goal is maybe the first question that we need to consider. 
And how does he get to that goal? The goal. If you want to know what the goal is in Paul's sermon here, you have to go to the end of the text. It really wasn't a defense for himself. He makes it really clear throughout his ministry that he's not all about self-preservation. It doesn't matter if he dies. Look at verse six, uh, chapter 26 and verse 28. It says, And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all those who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Agrippa suddenly realizes at the end of this sermon that he's being delivered, or his defense, and he realizes, amazed, realizes what Paul is doing here. He basically says, are you trying to convert me? Are you really trying to convert me? And Paul says, not just you. Yes, I'm trying to convert you. I'm trying to get you to understand uh, the gospel of King Jesus. But not just you, but everyone in my hearing. Didn't mean to click that. And Agrippa sees that Paul is using this trial as an occasion to try to persuade. And Agrippa says, do you really think in such a short time you can persuade me to become a Christian? Right here, right now, on the spot? You really think you have the powers of persuasion to suggest that I'm going to follow King Jesus? Do you know who I am? Do you know my entourage? Do you know what we're doing here? Did you forget where you're at right now? Do you, realize, do you realize what you have on your legs and on your arms? You're shackled, Paul. Do you really think you're going to make me become a Christian? And Paul says, yeah, if I can get there. If I can get to that spot, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also those, all those who hear me this day might become, become part of the way. So you see that Paul's goal, his objective, is persuasion. It's not defense. It's persuasion. And if this is the objection, then how does he persuade? How does anybody persuade? How does anybody get persuaded by anything at all? Okay. To prove it, okay, yeah, absolutely, that's a big part of it, Uh, proving it. You kind of hear people talk about that. I can't believe Christianity unless you prove it to me. So there is part of that being in persuasion. What else? You have to have an open mind. Yeah, the, the recipient who's trying to become persuaded has to have an open mind. Absolutely, that's a big part of persuasion. What if you're trying to persuade somebody? What would you appeal to other than maybe rational, reasonable thinking? What you're behind it, you believe in it, you're doing it. Yeah, yeah, you're you're living it is is maybe a good way that you would describe that, Tom. Yeah, absolutely. What else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because they know there's something they're missing, they're lacking. Yeah, absolutely. A uh, big part of persuasion is developing truth, developing that it's reasonable. You can reason through it. Yeah, absolutely. It's presented. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Evidence. Evidence. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big part of persuasion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Miss Debbie.
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you're wanting to if you're wanting to buy something and you're trying to convince your husband that you want that thing, how do you do it? All the ways it would benefit us. Okay, so sounds like we've had a conversation recently over in the Smith's house. So, so the, uh, there needs to be a need. Yeah, yeah, you have to develop a need. There has to be some reason why we need that shark vacuum. What we have now ain't working. Yeah, absolutely. Or we need that swimming pool because I need to get my laps in. I'm tired of going to the BAC. Yeah, you're trying to develop a need. What else? Yeah. There we go. Yes, he's a yes man. He's probably learned. He's probably learned from difficult situations. So we see that developing persuasion has is multifaceted. It's always reason. We've we've developed that. There's a case for it. There's evidence for it. Plus other things. Emotional things, uh, it, it may be reasonable to have this thing, personal experiences, your social surroundings, our feelings may be involved with persuasion. Yeah, John. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Brian. Yeah. 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 He's he's committed to the gospel all the way to the throne room, for sure. Absolutely. Um, but persuasion, it, it's, it's always a mixture of things, right? It's not just uh, feelings. It's not just rational, reasonable, reasonable thinking. It's a mixture of things. And I think it's because we're people. We're not just brains floating around earth, so we're just reason and rational beings. But on the other hand, we're, we're not just feelings floating around either, right? So it's kind of a, a blending, a mixture of multiple things that kind of help understand persuasion. It's rational. It's personal. It's emotional. So persuasion is a result of a number of things. You shouldn't believe Christianity just because... You feel it, right? Your personal feelings. I know God exists because I feel it, right? I feel His presence. He's answered my prayers. He's, he's walking right along beside me. Why is that so dangerous? Yeah, give it a couple years. Give it a couple years. Your feelings will change, right? Over years, over months, over hours, over minutes. Your feelings change. There's nothing really constant with your feelings. Your prayers in the future may not be answered how you thought they should be answered. Just like Jamie described. So, it's not just the rational... It's not 
just your personal feelings, but it's both that help us to understand persuasion. And Paul is out to persuade, right? Agrippa and his entourage and us today, Christianity, he's trying to describe to all of us that Christianity is true. How does he do it? How does he develop that Christianity can make sense? He does it in three different ways in this text. He says that it is rational, it is personal, and it's biblical. What I mean by personal is not a personal revelation or a personal feeling, but that it's personal. Every one of us have a conversion story of our own, correct? And we know of people who have amazing conversion stories, correct? That's what I mean by personal. Uh, it's rational. Look in verse uh, 20, let's see, 24 of chapter 26. What does Festus say? What's his response to what Paul has just described? Yeah, the, the English kind of, kind of softens that a little bit. You know, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Is that how it went? No. He goes, whoa, whoa, Paul, you're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. You are out of your mind. All this learning that you've done, the PhDs you've developed, the seminaries that you've gone to, you are out of your mind. That's, that's what I think it says. He says you're nuts. And you expect us to believe this? You're out of your mind. But what does Paul say in response to this accusation? Does he sound like somebody that's out of his mind when he answers that accusation? No, not at all. Notice that Paul doesn't immediately point to his insides like we just described. He doesn't say, well, Festus, I know this is true uh, because I feel that it, this is true. I know that Christianity is true because I feel it in my heart. It's not what he says. He doesn't go to the emotion. He goes to the publicly available evidence. Paul says that it is reasonable, what I'm saying. It's rational, what I'm saying. And it is true. Then he turns to Agrippa. Why does he turn to Agrippa? Why didn't he just lay it all out there for Festus and put him in his place? Because he's just insulted Paul. Why does he turn to Agrippa? Yeah. Festus wasn't ready. Festus wasn't ready to approach the gospel just yet, obviously. Obviously from his response. But the king is familiar with these things. Uh, Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection. And I can speak freely to him, is what Paul thinks. So he turns to him and says, I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice. Because these things were not done in a corner. That is a really powerful statement. To say that everything that Jesus has done, these public miracles that have been performed, they've all been done in public. There's nothing that he has done that has not been laid out. And, and those that are recorded are just a slice of what was actually taking place. You see in John 21, at the end of John's Gospel... He says in John 21, now in verse 25, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So perhaps thousands of people still alive when he's preaching this saw these miracles. And so Agrippa, or Paul says to Agrippa, you can't laugh this off. You know this really happened. 
You were 10 years old when Jesus was walking around on this earth. You know what happened. You can see, you know, people talking on the streets to each other. You know, I know that the Christians are who they are. You know, they're kind of crazy. They're kind of strange. They're kind of weird. I don't really like them. But I knew that boy in name. He died. I knew his mother. She was a widow, and I saw her grief, and I saw her hopelessness that her son died. But I saw Jesus touch that casket or that beard and that boy's funeral procession. And I saw that dead man sit up and begin to speak. Or, I don't like this Christianity thing, but when Jesus said that Jairus' daughter, that 12-year-old girl, was not dead but sleeping, I laughed. I laughed when Jesus said that. But when he told her to rise up, and immediately she walked, I stood there in amazement. Or Lazarus. I, I smelled Lazarus's body, and it stunk. It stank. It stunk. He was really dead. And I saw the grief of his sisters. But he got up. How do you explain that? Thousands of people saw that. Paul says, you know, you may not believe today, you, you may not believe tomorrow, but you can't laugh this off. You can't have the same response that Festus had, because Festus isn't ready for the gospel. Festus isn't understanding of what happened in this region. He doesn't understand who Jesus was and what he did. He points to the empty tomb. Hundreds of people claimed to see Jesus alive. In 1 Corinthians 15, how many people all at one time claimed to see him alive? 500. 500 people. You don't have group hallucinations. You don't have them. Um, at this point, many people had already died for their faith. You don't die for a hoax. Paul is able to look at a man and say... You know I'm not crazy. You may not believe right now. You may not believe tomorrow. You can't laugh this off. Because these things were not done in private. We didn't do them behind closed doors. Thousands of people saw them. Any comments or questions? I saw Jim's hand go up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you see the difference maybe in one of Paul's other sermons that his sermon ended in him being stoned because they weren't ready to necessarily hear about the resurrection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yes? And, and how important to believe what he was up against because mm -hmm. it seems to be part of their belief. Yeah.
Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fulfillment of what Jesus had instilled in him. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Pride is certainly the root of a lot of things that get in our way. Any other buddy? Any? Somebody has one. Okay. Um, so Paul makes a rational case here. It claims that something actually happened. But he doesn't just make a strictly rational case. Because nobody, like we just described, nobody can get all the way into faith just off of reason. So Christianity doesn't just make rational sense, but it makes personal sense to Paul. And you see that in his conversion story, his, his life before his conversion, his life after his conversion. You see that in verses 4 through 18. Of chapter 26. And in verses 4 through 11, he emphasizes his place within the Jewish religious landscape. He was a strict Pharisee. He admits that he was a fanatical persecutor of the church. Paul treated them as blasphemers and charlatans. Their movement was to be seen as a threat, a cancer attacking Israel. And undermining Israel and everything that they believed in. And it must be uprooted. And he took the lead in uprooting it. He describes his behavior in verse 11 of chapter 26 as raging fury against them. Raging fury. What a way to describe how you were acting towards some people. He said, I punished them. I locked them up. And it's interesting, look in verse 11 uh, of chapter 26. It was almost as if his goal as a defender of, of Judaism was to not make these Christians look like martyrs. Didn't want to necessarily kill them. He would if he had to. But he wanted to make them blasphemers of Jesus Christ. Why did he want to do that? Is that maybe more... Poison to Christianity than killing somebody. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if, if you could make them renounce their faith in Jesus. That was the goal. And it describes synagogue after synagogue. He wanted to force them to blaspheme. To call Jesus a curse. Making a mo mockery of his claim. Of him being king. And being the resurrected savior. That this hope for Israel, he describes in his, in his uh, statements, it can't be wrapped up in a risen Savior. But he lays out his hope. And as a Pharisee, what do Pharisees believe in? They believe in the resurrection. They believe in a resurrection of the dead. But they didn't see that a risen king was going to be their Messiah. A resurrected body is going to be our king, is going to be our Messiah, he's going to be our hope. They didn't see it that way. They had this connection between hope and the hope for Israel and the hope that God would keep his promise he made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But it was only when the gospel dawned on him that he realized that the very thing he wanted in life, he could never have. Except through Jesus. He wanted to honor the law of God. And that's what he was trying to do. He was fiercely persecuting these blasphemers. Based upon the law. And he wanted to honor the law of God. But Jesus Christ came. 
and was the only human being to ever completely live the life that he was trying to live, totally obeying the law, living the life that, she, that he should have lived. And he died the death that Paul should have died. Jesus took the penalty for Paul's law-breaking. And Paul suddenly realizes after all this time that the thing that he wanted most in life was to obey the law of God, could only happen if he obeyed the gospel. The gospel explained to him why he was such a mess. But it didn't just leave him in a mess. It resolved it at the same time. And his hope for Israel was radically transformed by the resurrected king. It was rooted in hope of a future king. And his experience on the Damascus Road enlightened his misunderstanding of hope. Look in verses, uh, let's see, 18. It was personal for Paul. It was personal for Jesus as well. It says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. What's a goad? What would you, what would you use a goad for? Stick something with, yeah. Here we go with sheep. Sheep are pretty stupid. They go over cliffs. They fall into water. They're like a lemming, pretty much. Uh, shepherds never did anything for their sheep that wasn't for their own good. We talked about that last week. But one of the only ways that a shepherd can get a sheep to do anything is to stick them with a goad, right? Or to stick an ox with a goad. Maybe another way to describe that. Jesus is telling Paul, don't resist what God has in store for you. Don't resist what God has planned for you because it's futile. So do you see what Paul is appealing to? He's appealing to his personal account, his personal conversion story in order to persuade Agrippa. He's trying to convey, uh, before Jesus, I was a complete mess. And with Jesus, I was able to resolve that mess. And so the gospel started to make personal sense for him. It's only in Jesus Christ that his life would certainly be resolved. And only in Jesus will I be able to get what I've been after my whole life. And when you start seeing that, Christianity is not just making rational sense, it's making personal sense. Anybody have any comments or questions? Yeah, Brian. Part of the value of Paul's testimony during this time is that he's laying out all the reasons why he's persecuting Christians. Yeah. He's laying out the Yeah, I mean, he, that's kind of his, that's kind of Romans in a nutshell, so to speak. In, in Romans 7, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. When he looks at the law, he's like, all, all that I see is just wretch. I see death. I see I can't keep it. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? It's almost just like, I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to do. He says, thanks be to God, in verse 25, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Verse 1 of chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That was his conclusion of being in Jesus, that he kept the law for him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. But from a biblical standpoint, yeah. they do think one of these spiritual things could happen and then mess them up. Yeah, yeah. So not only does the gospel make rational sense to Paul, uh, there's evidence for it in history. Uh, not only does the gospel make sense in his life, but thirdly, and most importantly, the gospel makes sense in the Bible. You see in verses 22 of chapter 26, he simply tells the story of Jesus. He tells the gospel. He says in verse 22 of of Acts 26, To this day I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, And that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. What we've described throughout this class is that he told the story of Jesus. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the euangelion of King Jesus is this right here. And you see that he does not deviate from what he laid out as the first importance discussion in 1 Corinthians 15. He describes it as coming from the prophets in Moses and Acts, which would correlate with according to the scriptures. He describes that Christ must suffer. Uh, Christ died is what it's described in 1 Corinthians It describes that he was the first to rise from the dead. He was raised on the third day. And then in Acts 26, he he describes it as proclaiming light both to our people and to Gentiles. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, he describes it as in Christ shall all be made alive. He tells the story of Jesus. And when you read the Bible and when you read it through the lens of Jesus Christ... And you focus in on the narrative of the Bible with Jesus being at the center, the Bible becomes alive. You know, you, you've read the Bible your whole life, possibly, and you're reading something through that lens of understanding who Jesus is, both personally, rationally, reasonably, and you're reading the Bible, and it just opens up Scripture. The lights, the light bulb turns on, right? When you're reading scripture from that lens. And it becomes alive. And Paul realizes that in the story of Jesus, the gospel, this euangelion of Jesus, this is exactly what his hope was placed in. I think there's a really good comparison in Luke. When Luke describes these two men on the road to Emmaus, Jesus has died. And how would you describe these two men? Are they happy? They hurt, they heartbroken. Yeah, they're, yeah uh, that's a great way to put it. They're, they're heartbroken. It describes, we hoped he was the one. We hoped that he was going going to restore Israel. That sound familiar? Kind of sounds like Paul. He he thought that, that, you know, he was trying to get this restoration back to Israel. What he hoped in was not the right thing. And, and, and And they're crushed. They feel pain. And Jesus meets them on the road. And says, what are y'all talking about? And they're like, dude, are you, are you living under a rock? Like, do you know what's been going on around here? Like, we had this guy here named Jesus. And, you know, Jesus like, here we go again. Um, and they're saying, amazing things have happened around here. And we hoped, we thought he was him. 
And Luke 24 and verse 25 says, O foolish ones of slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And he opens up their minds and understanding, beginning from the prophets and Moses. And what, what does it say their hearts are doing? They're burning. Because they have experienced Jesus through Scripture through personally experiencing Him through Scripture and understanding who He was. That's the gospel. That's the gospel and understanding that we serve a risen King. Thank you so much. I appreciate everything y'all have done.